so in terms of our Siapumalela project, basically our project is based on a simple uh, principle. What we are focusing on, we are trying to understand, profile all of the students, incoming students, new students to the university in terms of their background so that we can be able to understand in terms of their readiness for university. That is the key aspect of our uh, project. And from there, once we've collected that information, the second part is how do we integrate it with all of the other systems and student information which are available at the university. The third part, it has to do with capacity buildings because once we have all of that information, the next uh, phase is how then do we move in terms of data analytics? How do we use that information for data-driven decisions? So under objective number one, in terms of our student biographic uh, data, so what we do is under this objective, we are profiling each and every student that is registering for the first time at VETS. We're collecting that information. So the information that we collect is quite extensive, it's comprehensive. It ranges from uh, school background, home background, uh, financial uh, plans in terms of your university funding and all of that. So it covers quite a range of issues so that from that perspective, and then we're able to know what are some of the possible challenges that the students might be facing. So once we collect that information, so this year we, on an annual basis, we produce a student BQ report that goes to the various uh, management levels. So for, the, for example, this one, it, it, it was presented to the university council and our executive management team. One of the key things which we have seen is, so we started collecting this information in 2016, and we have seen quite a drastic increase in terms of the, the overall response rate from, from the students. So if you can see that in 2016, we were sitting at about 80%, and in 2018, we reached a 95% mark. So that was quite remarkable. So we're talking about a, a overall respondent of 6,223 students out of 6,320. So that is quite impressive. So one of the things which come to mind is what are some of the lessons which have enabled us to see that drastic increase? So I'm just going to share with you briefly. So the key thing, the first key thing is planning. So we start planning as early as now for the data collection for 2019. So that is one of the key things that we are doing. And we all of the stakeholders who are involved in this process, ICT, AS, ASU, a Student Enrollment Center, we start to involve them as early as possible. And as part of uh, our planning, we also have training. So in terms of all of those people that we know that they're going to be playing a critical role, so we, we train them in terms of what the student BQ is all about and some of the possible uh, queries that they might be getting from students. So one of the critical things which has happened actually in 2017 was the so we implemented a, a couple of things which I believe they caused a turnaround in terms of our response rate. So the first one was we developed a, a student BQ guide which was part of the, uh, the registration pro uh, process. The second thing that we did, we developed a dedicated BQ help desk. So students who are encountering problems in terms of they are in, you know, put, uh, engagement with the system, they will know who to call, send an email or, or call or come in so that their issues are, are being sorted up. And another thing that we did was we set up a specific uh, sort of like a, 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 a lab computer where those students who are oh, uh, having problems, they come physically and then we assist them. So those were the things actually which sort of like changed things around for us. And one of the things that we did was we also had, uh, you know, follow up emails, SMS call campaigns towards the end so that we are able to get as much response rate as we could uh, possibly get. So those are the things actually which we believe uh, assisted us in that increased response rate. As I've said, we the information that we're collecting is quite comprehensive. So the key thing here is we're looking at quite a number of uh, variables. So uh, demographic background, gender, uh, quintile classification, we're looking at language, whether the student is first generation, and all of those things. So here, the recipe is, we collect this information, we should collect it and have it as ready as early as possible, because it's no use to have this information and then it just sits there. So, so for example, 
one of the uh, variables which I'm not showing here is in terms of uh, finances. So one of the things that we ask the, the students is who's going to be paying for your fees and what we've seen is most of the students, about 22%, and then they'll say their funding is not yet concluded. So that is at the stage of the registration pro uh, process. So how then do you deal with that? So it shows that at that particular moment, those students using this system, you will be able to identify those students and be able to channel them to necessary help that can be able to assist them in terms of fast tracking or sorting out their financial aid. Because you don't want to have students uh, you know, in the middle of the academic uh, classes and then they're still busy trying to sort out their funding issues. So the key here is we're collecting all of this information so that as soon as possible we have it and then we make it available to all of the people at the faculty level so that whenever they are making their plans, they know the kind of students that they are dealing with in that particular year. In terms of the second objective, so once we have collected all of this comprehensive information, what we are aiming to do is to integrate it to all of our systems which we have. So including the student support interventions which are happening at the various faculties. And we believe that once we have that, it should be it should give a meaningful uh, impact in terms of the work that you are doing. So one of the expected outcomes is we should be able to, once we have integrated this information, be able to develop a student success dashboards. Uh, what then we have done so far is we've managed to roll them out uh, to the in, in these five uh, faculties. Also critical here is we are linking all of that information to the student uh, support programs so that they are get used by the faculties. And the critical thing here is we as institutional research, we don't just develop these tools, but we go to the faculties and say, what are your requirements in terms of how do you want the data to be like? How do you want it to be packaged so that you are able to engage with it? So th that is what we are doing in terms of this objective. So this is just an example of one of the dashboards that we have developed. And these were some of the variables that they specifically wanted about their students. So you can see that once they see that this is the percentage of or, or the number of first generation students that they have, and then possibly they, they might be able to, you know, to link that to their interventions. The third objective in terms of uh, capacity building and all of the initiatives which are taking place there. We have a student success uh, structure, which at the bottom, we have uh, working groups. So those working groups, they are faculty based and going forward, we're also going to have extra uh, working groups that will include, for example, uh, the, the office of the student dean and all of that. So those working groups, they, they fit into the steering committee, which fits into the senate and teaching learning, which oversees all of our activities. What is critical here is the working groups. The working groups, this is where now you have your student involvement, your, your academics, the faculty coordinators, which sit and discuss in terms of what needs to be done in terms of the information that must be collected. So these uh, working groups, they are critical in the whole student success uh, movement at VETS. One of the critical things that we've done uh, in April this year was all of those uh, student success stakeholders working groups we had a meeting where a workshop where we were discussing where VET is going in terms of uh, student success one of the things that we did was we had to define student success in terms of VET context what are some of the critical things and one of the things which came up was uh, student food security so that one came up as one of the critical issues that we have to attend going forward so this is uh, the participants which were present during that meeting. So what are some of the things that you can be able to do once you've collected this information? So I'm just going to share with you briefly what we can possibly do. It's quite a number of things that we, we, we can be able to do. So what we've done is we've looked at the 2016 cohort that completed the, the, the student BQ from two faculties and then we were, look, we were looking at two variables, the, generation, uh, the first generation status. So what then we found was Following on the first generation status, we found that about 47% were first generation uh, students. And following them, here I'd like to draw your attention to those students who had uh, computers at their schools. And then you'll see that we have quite about 25% of that cohort who were not exposed to computers. And then if you include those in their schools that they did not have computers and those 
even though they had computers, but they did not use the computers. And then you you have a percentage of about 43% of students who were not engaged with those facilities. And this information becomes critical because once a student comes to university and most of the assignments, assessment and all of that, they have to be done uh, using computers and it becomes a problem. One of the things which was highlighted to me was one of the students who, who came in to fill the, the BQ that we were helping could not navigate his way around how to complete the survey online. So it showed that that student had issues in terms of computer skills. So those are the students that as early as possible and then you give them the intervention. And then in this cohort, the first uh, generation cohort, you see that in terms of their progression, you will see the various columns, how they progressed. But what is significant is that the average academic performance was at around 57.9%. Their progression rate was about 70%. And then when you look at the non-first generation uh, cohort of it, and then you will see, you'll notice that under the race, the white students has increased to about 22%. And then you go to even to the school quintiles, you see now that you're looking at a different picture. So those students who are coming from quintiles one, two, three, the percentage is now low. In terms of those who had uh, facilities, also the, the percentage uh, goes down. What is key is in terms of the academic performance, there's differences in terms of the academic performance between those two cohorts. So all of those uh, students, they were exposed to one type of uh, the student support which is available at VETS. So all of them, they would have interacted uh, at some stage with all of these uh, support programs which are available. And I've got my colleagues here who can be able to talk in more details in terms of what these support programs are all about. So now what I've done is I've shown you, once we've collected the student uh, biographical questionnaire, how then we can be able to for example, follow it through. But then now I want to, to show you what are, uh, some of the faces which are behind this data, because sometimes it's easy to just sit with the computer and look at the data. As soon as you hear the stories behind it and then it completely changes your perception. So on that note, I'd like to call Siamo, who's just going to share his personal experience with us. My name is Siamo Mudise. I'm a second year BA student at the University of Watwatsrand, majoring in political sciences and international relations. I was born in Gauteng at a small township called Mabopani. I'm the last born in my family with two brothers and two sisters. All of us were raised up by unemployed parents and they found it difficult to raise us, but they made sure that we had something to eat before we go to sleep. There is no one in my family who attended university. I'm the first one fortunately and the best to, to attend kind of the best uh, prestigious university like vets so and i believe that i'm not the last one to attend the university because we have to think about we, we have to think about who who are coming after us people who are coming after us the generation and we also have to to thank those who gone before us to have the opportunities to proceed on. I wanted to be a lawyer when I grew up because my mother was used to, to tell me that I like, I like to ask a lot of questions. This was a sign for her to me to become a great lawyer. And she's the one who inspired me by all, all the time to become a lawyer because she was always supporting me. And I found it difficult to pursue my dreams because at the background that I come from, there is no educational support or there is no someone who can be able to motivate or who can be a role model to, to be inspired from him or her. So I had to be self-motivated and with the support of my mother of being a lawyer, I worked so hard and smart and to keep on pushing to arrive at the university even until today. And I kept, and I kept on pushing to fulfill my dreams. I attended uh, public schools from primary school to high school, uh, which is Riyatlehile Primary School, Nakamaseko, Shejiwe, and Ekangala Comprehensive. During my time when I was still doing basic education academically, I was performing well, and even on top of that, I was one of the top students in history and business studies. I was a monitor in class for 12 years of my schooling, I was playing football, I was in 
the choir and one I was one of the ba ba bass singer and like <laughs> yeah <laughs> early 2016 I, I registered for my degree at VETS so that like uh, I can be motivated on top of that and at first I registered for BA law but I changed to BA general but still the dream of my mom will come true, you'll see. And like, I um, want to still continue to major with political sciences and international relations. I had so much experiences during my first year at VET, but I never gave up on pursuing my dreams. I never had funding, accommodation, and the money for transport because I had to travel from Pretoria to Johannesburg each and every day so that I can be able to attend lecture classes but when I did not have enough money of transport, I had to sleep at computer labs, secretly so, so that other students cannot laugh at me. And on other times, on other times, uh, I was staying at home, even though I don't have money. But like I kept on pursuing my dreams. Even during the weekends, I'm trying to work so hard. I have part-time job at McDonald's Park Town, so that I can be able to afford basic necessities such as toiletry and stuff, at least to be a cool kid also. So at VES, we, we, we have supportive programs like uh, Siapumelela Project and one of the most powerful program that they are pushing, we call it CCDU, is the Career Counseling and Development Unit. It helps with counseling and therapy of students. It also related to all aspects of the university life. It, helps, it also helps students to build a bridge between university and a real world through a career development. Even people like Ms. Ndumpumelelo Bengu, Ms. Genevieve, Mrs. Fezilum Juli, and Dr. Mtolisi Masango, they are always there for students like me uh, to keep on pursuing their dreams. And they're working so hard to cope on academically. And with the assistance, it means a lot to students like me. What I want to achieve in my life is that I want to see myself in the next five years as a well-qualified academic in political sciences and international relations. And I want to keep on empowering students who lost hope to furthermore in their studies, especially in townships and rural areas. And I want to keep on pushing, especially to young black women who come from disadvantaged backgrounds to keep on pushing on their dreams and pursue them. I believe that we have to work so, so hard and keep on working so that like our dreams must come true. I thank you. Forward with student success, forward. Wow. My name is Dumelo Gladignani, and I'm here to share about the formal structures and programs within the University of the Fitvaltas Rund. I am a third year accounting science student studying towards becoming a chartered accountant. Accounting is a degree within the Commerce, Law and Management faculty at the University of Fitz. Within the faculty, there is a structured program called the Road to Success. The Road to Success is managed by Tsepiso Maleswana and Donnie de Glark. Say hi guys. <laughs> they assist students with adjusting to university life. Their approach is to pair senior students and junior students within the same degree and faculty and have them share their life experiences and advice and strategies to attain success. These mentors um, use weekly tutorial sessions as well as one-on-one -on -one sessions to pass on their advice and strategies. This program has benefited me personally as it reiterates the, the basics of, um, it reiterates the basics of perfecting um, the basic ideals, such as time management and living a balanced life. Having the ability to share my experiences when I'm struggling or when I'm unable to cope with academic st stress and pressure has helped me to succeed. Furthermore, the road to success has a clothing bank for those in need. Vitz also additionally has a food bank and a food garden. In 2016, I joined Inala, a student-run society which cultivates and grows fruits and vegetables on campus, and donates all the produce to the food bank. 
This helps students who don't have access. Another strategic partner of the food bank is Gift of the Givers. The WITS Humanitarian Fund was set up by the WITS SRC in the aftermath of the Feasible Fall protests. It raises money by seeking funding from alumni as well as other sectors of society and tackles financial exclusion by students. The Careers, Counseling and Development Unit, as mentioned by Tiamo, is one of the greatest resources at WITS. It helps address mental health issues with, that students are facing, specifically with regards to academic pressure, social and financial pressures. Personally, this has been my greatest resource because having professionals who can speak to you and give you guidance on how to tackle your problems has really been constructive. Furthermore, within the resident system, House Committees host weekly Sunday night tutorials to assist first years with their academic works. These are just a few of the many programs that the university offers. Thank you. This shows, while they're coming on, on to the podium, this shows that we've got students who have got potential, irrespective of their background. But then as uh, academics and university support uh, staff, the challenge that we have is to make sure that we support these uh, guys so that they are able to, to reach their dreams. So that's the message that we are trying to show, to say, irrespective of their challenges, as long as we are there, our function is to make sure that we provide them with all the necessary support so that they are able to achieve whatever they want to achieve. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of our future plans, and then we, as part of our bonus grant, we will look at monitoring and evaluation of some of our support interventions and continue in terms of our predictive models once we've collected all of the data and going forward. Thank you, everybody. My name is Fezile Mizugi from VITS, and I have two very brief slides that are going to talk about meaningful partnerships. So one of the key, almost understated outcome of the Sipomalela project has been that institutions have been able to engage with one another. The Siapumilela model facilitated by SEDI has made it easy for institutions to come together and has created a place where um, partnership is encouraged and we appreciate the wealth of knowledge that already exists within the Siapumilela group. VITS has enjoyed amazing partnerships with all the Sierra Pumalela universities, but today we're just going to focus on our partnership that we have with the University of Pretoria. Um, our, our partnership has blossomed over the past year. We have done lots of mini projects that have been incredibly um, successful. At the core of our collaboration has been predictive analytics. Um, and we were really interested in finding out how variables such as um, changing programs, funding, race, gender, influences completion time. And UP had, um, uh, had used Bayesian networks a lot and we've see, we had seen very impressive presentations in this conference and also in previous conferences where they had used Bayesian models. So we wanted to learn from them. So there has been a lot of um, knowledge exchanged. Um, we have uh, cooperated in trainings and worked together in many workshops. Um, and what we are going to talk about today is just the Bayesian modeling part and the kind of conclusions that we came to based on that. I'm sure you're wondering why I'm sitting next to you. That's the partnership we're talking about. <laughs> Okay, my name is Ben, I'm from University of Pretoria. Um, I'm going to talk to you, I give you a feel of what we're doing with the data because I'm actually sitting with the data. So we're using Bayesian networks and it was because of Kresge Foundation that we managed to get funding and get people to get into and help us with the skills transfer as well. We got Alta, Deval from Start of Med and State Department of UP. Then she helped us with the, building the Bayesian network and she even transferred the skills to me so that I can be able to read on my own. I'm even further in there, I'm doing more machine learning and everything now. I'm actually a fund, you know. So the Bayesian network is actually, uh, we're using conditional probabilities actually. So it's the probability of, a, of an event given that another event is already okay. So it's more of a what if statement. So we're putting variables together in the Bayesian network and then see if we play around with the variables, what is happening into the imaging patterns 
that are coming from the data. So this is basically the standard model of UP. So we used the 2011, 2012, and 2013 cohorts. So we follow those students from there until maybe I'll say 2018 to see how they've been progressing through the system. But the main variable there, which is in red, there is change program. So we want to see if those students are changing programs, how, what is happening to their profile, and then if they also complete in minimum time. So it's changing program and completing minimum time. We want to see what is the emerging patterns that we see in the data once we actually go into those variables. And one of the significant variables there is funding, which is it comes quite a lot because even the minister was speaking about it and we know the fees must fall and everything. So funding is very a significant variable that we actually see on the model. And we can also go into faculties and see deep into faculties what is actually happening in the, in the model. And the duration of, of, as well of the from three years to six year programs. So our findings from UP, we see that the stars are white female students there. So they are more, like, more likely to complete in minimum time. So we it also poses a question of what kind of research can we mo do more and look at them and see what they did right and just the positive thing that uh, qual quantity qualitative research can be done on there and just find out how they progress through the system and be able to inspire other students. And finding also, as I mentioned, that is very, it's very significant as well. We know about it. It's, you don't have to do a Bayesian model to know. You just know that fund is a very important variable. And changing programs as well. He's, he spoke about it as well that he wanted to do law, things like that. So it's very important to, when you get in for the student to actually know what he wants to do or know what are the possibilities that he can follow so that they don't change programs. So we see that it's more likely the student that changes program stay longer in the system. So we took this data as well and did the same thing, but we used Tableau. And then we find that at first, with this, we have African females. So the females are actually doing well. I don't know, hey, men, we are not represented. <laughs> so, and funding and changing programs are also significant there as well. So we're actually willing to go further actually and get more data and do more cohorts with the soft variables. I'll show you now the current work that we're doing. The school quintiles, the information of the school quintiles is not that, uh, it's not accurate in the system. So we're trying to actually get more data into there so that you can add the soft data into the, into the model. The home language as well is the language that we want to look at and versus the language of instruction or language of preference. Funding, we also want to get more type of funding. If you look at this data, the, most of the funding is from NEFSAS. UP, they have a lot of fundings like from education, they have different funding. So it's a more different data. So we want to go into details into explaining that. So we are currently busy with that right now. And the most of data from BQ, so a questionnaire like they have as well, getting the accommodation, first generation status, rurality, and parents' income. From us, we use the data from STARS, which is the student academic readiness data. So the first generation is mentioned that is TMO is that is the first generation. So those variables are very important to want to see if they are very significant looking at them in terms of explaining the success of a student in the university. So with that, in that note, I'd like to thank Prof. Wendy, and Dr. Jean-Claude, and Alta, Dr. Mutolishi for giving us the opportunity, and Kriksi Foundation for, give, for making it possible for us to collaborate and, and share knowledge and transfer skills, build capacity, and also to shine. So thank you so much.